Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning to the Lexington Church of Christ. We're glad you're here, and if you are our visitors, we're glad you're here. And if you are visiting with us, we'd just like for you to fill out one of them cards in front of you on the pew and just drop it in the little box in the back so we'll have a, a thing, record of your visit with us. And if you would, just stick around a little bit. We'd be glad to talk to you, and we'd be glad to give anybody would want to know why we worship the way we worship, we can give you biblical answers for the things we do and why we do them. We're glad you're here today. Got quite a few things to go over this morning. Hopefully I don't miss anything. And if I do, don't feel left out because it'll be my fault. Might be on here for me to read out and I've missed it. Several things here going on as we are have a fairly lengthy prayer list and some things to add to it. If you look through the prayer list, we had an update on Carol Atkins. She did have her surgery, her bladder surgery, and it was not cancerous. And uh, she's uh, getting through that, dealing with a lot of pain and other issues. I always remember Ted. Ted's still continuing to go with several issues, but he is home working with that. And remember Renard Edwards. He's not here this morning, and he's He's adjusting to a lot of his medication and things, and he's taking dialysis. And As you all know, he's uh, struggling through those issues with kidney failure and things. And so he's struggling through a lot of issues there. And I definitely remember him in, his, in your prayers. And James Cockerham, he's here today, and he's had some reactions to some of his medications too. And so definitely remember all of these. They're having reactions to their medications and trying to get through the health issues that they're dealing with. They're in a lot of struggles. Also, Libby Friedel is going to have some eye surgery on May the 5th, so definitely remember her. That's coming up. A uh, couple things that are sad note, extremely sad note. As you all know, you may know, you may not know, Melvin Sapp's been on our prayer list a long time. He lost his battle yesterday, Saturday. So, uh, Renard, I mean, uh, Melvin had been in since, November ish in the hospital and for that transplant and it ended yesterday. We definitely remember Melvin's family. Uh, also Dixie Black's brother, uh, Mike Florence, uh, only information we have was killed in an automobile accident uh, Friday night. So Dixie is uh, I think in route to go there and pin with that and deal with that. So definitely remember Dixie. Uh, Dixie also dealing with some hard issues. Definitely remember her on many, many fronts there, travel, dealing with the death in her family and hard issues that she has also. That's about all I have to add to our sick list this morning. And always remember if you have something going on, you can always send a text to our elders or Brock, either one, and they'll see that it gets on the list where it needs to be. Congregational happenings I got today is our deacons elding, elders meeting today at 430 here at the building which gives all of us an opportunity if you have anything that you'd like to discuss with the elders or what may be going on today's a good day for you to do that today here at the building at 430. Also coming up on Friday the 30th is our young ladies class they will meet here at the building at 6 p.m. for that. And we do have a couple area-wide gospel meetings or some bulletins and things on the bulletin board out there. And you can check that out and see if it's something that you're interested in some of our area-wide uh, congregations around us. Also, our Lord's Supper for September has not uh, been filled in. If anyone is uh, wanting to work with that and do those things that are doing with that, uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the board. We have one month left for this year that's not been uh, taken, September. I uh, think that is all the updates that I have here for this morning. It's not on the bulletin, but definitely look at our bulletin. There's many of our sick and uh, people on here, our friends and our relatives and the people that we know. And uh, definitely remember them in your prayers as we go. This morning as we begin our worship, our order of... Uh, Song leader this morning will be Andrew Kivett. Our opening prayer will be Brother John Harper. Our scripture reading before the communion will be Rick Maynard. 
Our scripture reading before the lesson will be Michael Hinesley, and our closing prayer this morning will be Frankie Klein. This time we have no other announcements. We'll begin with the opening prayer. Let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you this morning thanking you for this avenue of prayer, Heavenly Father. We realize that thou art the Almighty God, the creator and sustainer of life, of everything, Heavenly Father. And we just thank you for this, and we thank you that you do hear our prayers, that you love us, you want the best for us, Heavenly Father. And you sent the best from heaven, your son Jesus. You sent the very best to die on the cross for the sin of mankind. He had no sin, but he loved you to do the will, and he loved us, that he died for us. And we thank you for this. May we always be mindful of this, and mindful of this through everyday walk of life. Especially when we take the Lord's Supper this morning, may we remember that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those that are sick, not doing well at this time. We just pray that you'll be with Bernard, that the medicines that he has taken and the dialysis, that he will get adjusted to this, and that he'll feel good and be back here in our presence. And we just pray that you'll be with him. Pray that you'll be with James. Also, that the medicine that he has taken, will, his body will accept it, and that he'll continue to uh, heal from his back surgery and his heart problems. Be with him also. Pray to be with Sister Carol Atkins as she has <clears throat> had surgery and it's uh, good news, no cancer, and we thank you for this, but she has been in a lot of pain. We just pray to relieve this pain and she'll be, uh, be able to be back with us soon also. Heavenly Father, there's many on our prayer list can't remember them all, but you know their needs and wants. Those that are getting ready to have surgeries, uh, Sister Libby Friedel is going to have eye surgery again. Pray that that will go through well and that she'll come through that fine. Just be with these people and heal their bodies and give them back a portion of health as you see fit, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we're also mindful of those that have lost loved ones here recently. and We just pray especially for the Sapp family as Melvin has gone on to eternity, Heavenly Father. We're so thankful that he did die in the Lord, and we're thankful for this, and help the family to realize this and to understand this, and have comfort with this, but help us to comfort them any way we can through sending cards or phone calls, whatever we can do to help the family. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of Dixie Black, as she has lost her brother, and on her way in travels at this time, be with Dixie, be with the family there, comfort them also, Heavenly Father, as only you can. May they use your word. May we all use your word, Heavenly Father, for that comfort and that guidance. And Heavenly Father, on thy word, we're thankful for it, that we can read it and understand it, that we can know what we can do and what we must do to be with you in heaven one day and help us to read it and to do those things and help us to take it out to our loved ones, out to the world, and teach the gospel. Give us the courage to do this, Heavenly Heavenly Father, we thank you for this congregation here. We thank you for each and every member. Every member here is important. Heavenly Father, every member has a part of this congregation and part of thy kingdom, which is the church of Christ. We thank you for each member. Help us to do our very best through this walk of life. Help us to help one another. Help us to love one another. And that we will all be with thee in heaven one day. Now, dear Lord, as, I, as we close this prayer, we... Again, I'm mindful of all the many blessings, all the blessings of life. And we realize that all good things come from above, and we thank you for the country we live in, uh, the freedoms we have. Uh, we thank you for our government. We just pray that our government always leading the way, that we can worship you without fear and uh, always be able to live a quiet and peaceful life here on this earth. Dear Lord, dear Lord as we close this prayer, we humbly we come before thee realizing that we sin and we fall short from time to time that we think things that we say things and that we do things and we leave things undone that we should do and we beg and plead for thy forgiveness Heavenly Father we realize that there are conditions that must be met we must be willing to repent of those sins we must be willing to confess those sins publicly if they are public sin and dear Lord we know that you will forgive us 
We beg and plead for this forgiveness. In Christ's name, amen. Oh, 
the full award circle will be number 167. Number 167. After the singing of the song, we will observe the worship. <coughs> Why did the Savior taking the Lord's Supper this morning, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 23, 39 through 47. Luke 23, 39 through 47. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this first day of the week that we can assemble around this table to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ our Savior. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread, which symbolizes his broken body, that we'll do so in a manner pleasing and acceptable to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. bow once again. Our Father in heaven, in like manner, we thank you for this cup, 
which to us as Christians symbolizes the blood that Christ shed for our sins. We pray that we will also look back to that cross and remember the love that he had for us. May we partake of this in a manner pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, this concludes the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Let's all bow as we give back to and prosper. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all that we have, for all the blessings that you give us, the physical blessings of our homes, our families, our jobs. Also, Father, spiritual blessings of Christ our Savior. We pray that as we give back, as we've been prospered, that we'll do so cheerfully, and that these funds might be used to further spread thy kingdom, not only in Davidson County, but throughout the world. Pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Song for our scripture reading and our lesson from 279. From 279. Let's all stand with the same song. Give me the Bible, sorrow and sleeping, to cheer the wanderer, long and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance, peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible. Holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till I shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my
scripture reading this morning before the lesson comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 20. That's Matthew 27, 15 through 20. And I'm reading from the King James. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Probably most adults over the years have had a bad dream or two. What was the subject? Monsters, mayhem, madness of all sorts. How many of us have ever woken up terrified and in a cold sweat because we dreamed about Jesus? How many people have ever suffered because of a dream about Jesus. Well, we can name at least one, though the Bible doesn't reveal her name. We're just going to refer to her as Pilate's wife. Pilate's wife suffered many things in a dream because of a just man we know as Jesus of Nazareth. Question, did she really dream a dream or was this an elaborate deception. Well, we believe that she dreamed and told the truth about it. Question, what was the content of that dream? Well, the Bible doesn't give us any more details than those that are listed in Matthew 27 and verse 19. Whence came that dream? Well, we believe it was an inspired dream sent to her by God. Is there anything of value, therefore, to be learned from her dream and the context in which the Bible records it. That is our challenge for this morning. Our sermon is entitled, The Dream of Pilate's Wife. And there are three things that we want to consider. In the first place, let's talk about the source. Does the source of information change the integrity of the information? According to the inspired record of the Scriptures, Pontius Pilate was neither a good man nor a dummy. Pilate knew that the Jews had delivered Jesus to him out of envy. Listen along with the text of Matthew 27, beginning in verse 15. Now at that feast, the governor, that's Pontius Pilate, was wont or accustomed to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. You ought to go through the rest of the New Testament and see what type of words are associated with this Barabbas. None of them really are good at all. Pilate was the Roman governor or procurator of the province of Judea from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36 and declared that he could find in Jesus no fault at all at least three times. So the evidence presented Jesus to be faultless in John 18, 38, John 19, verse 4, and John 19 and verse 6. Once Pilate discovered that Jesus was a Galilean, he tried to pass off our Lord onto Herod, though Jesus was sent right back to Pilate. Luke 23, 1 through 12. Pilate's own wife sent unto him to make known her position on Jesus. Listen again to the text of Matthew 27 and verse 19. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife, what was her name? Don't know. We're just going to refer to her as Pilate's wife. Sent unto him saying, Have thou nothing to do with that? What was Pilate's wife's position on Jesus? Just man. 
For, here's why, I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now you'd think if a man was going to consider a source to be listened to, wouldn't a man consider his wife to be a pretty high up there source of information? Now we're not going to act like that her position to, to Pilate to say have nothing to do with him. He, Pilate, could have done more than what he did, but that Jesus was a just man? If your wife told you that someone was a just man, would that get your attention? Would you listen and say, maybe I need to re-examine some things? Because the Jews, he knew they had delivered Jesus to him out of envy. Pilate knew that. He had seen the evidence and he declared at least three times that I find no fault at all in this man. The evidence was clear. He was sent to Herod. Let Herod deal with it. Ah, it's coming right back to you, Pilate. You're going to have to make a decision. Then the man's own wife declares Jesus to be just. Does the source of the information change the integrity of the information? You know that the Bible teaches that Pilate also had a conversation with Jesus. That is remarkable in and of itself. In John 18, verses 33 through 37. But despite all this information presented before Pilate from various reliable sources, Pilate chose to listen to the multitude. Pick up in Matthew 27 and verse number 20. But, about every time in the Bible you read the word but, there's a contrast. There's what Pilate's wife had just sent to him and revealed, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Pilate chose to sentence the sinless Son of God to a brutal scourging and a vicious, merciless crucifixion. Pick up in Matthew 27 and verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water like this is going to do him and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Question. Did Pilate receive an adequate amount of accurate information from acceptable sources in order to make the proper determination about Jesus of Nazareth? Yes. There are plenty of sources right there. He had plenty of information. Accurate information. But what's the problem? Pilate cowered to the pressure of the multitude. In the second place, Let's talk about the statements. By that we mean, is there any evidence to conclude beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was indeed a just man? Pilate's wife proclaimed that Jesus was a just man, meaning that she believed Jesus to be innocent, holy, and righteous. That's the meaning of just. Matthew 25 and verse 46, as well as John 17 and verse number 25. So if a person is just, that person is righteous. And if a person is righteous, that means that person is right with God. So was Jesus right with God? Was he just? Was he a just man? Was Pilate's wife correct in her assessment? Now is it possible to present evidence from the inspired text of the Bible establishing that Jesus was indeed just and righteous? Well, we're going to answer that as yes, indeed. Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus, 
for 30 pieces of silver, later announced his remorse, the innocence of Jesus, and returned the money to those who paid him. Look at the text of Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4. Then Judas, this is Judas Iscariot, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they say, what is that to us? See thou to that. The chief priests, elders, and scribes revealed by implication the truth that Jesus of Nazareth had indeed healed people. Notice the text of Matthew 27, verses 41 and 42. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him. That means they were mocking Jesus, but notice what they said. With the scribes and elders said, he saved others. Is that true? Yes, indeed he did. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be, notice it, the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Perhaps the statements of Jesus from the cross are some of the greatest indications of his genuine righteousness that very much affirmed that he was a just man. While many of these people had most likely witnessed other crucifixions, they'd probably never heard anyone pray for those that had put them there. Let's look at the text of Luke 23. Let's notice beginning in verse number 32. Luke 23, beginning in verse number 32, what we really see here is the, probably the first statement of Jesus from the cruel cross of Calvary. Luke 23, 32, And there were also two others, malefactors, that's criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, it's also called Golgotha, the Calvary seems to be the Latin description for this place, there they crucified him, and the malefactors are the criminals, one on the right hand, the other in the left. It said that the meanest of the mean was placed in the middle, the lowest of the low. And that's where they placed our Lord. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now put yourself there. He's got nails in his body. A crown of thorns shoved on his head. He's been scourged without mercy. Had these people seen others crucified? Yeah, they saw two others. At least on his right and on his left. Do you remember them praying? for the people that had put them there? Indeed not. They parted his raiment and cast lots. You know, they had perhaps never heard anyone express such care and compassion for others. Look at the text of John 19. This is probably the third statement from the cross. John 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, that's probably John the Apostle, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Notice the care. Notice the compassion. Notice Jesus' understanding. I'm going, but you all are going to be here. You need to handle this. Take care of my mama. Had they ever seen anyone else be crucified? Well, they had seen two others. On his right and on his left. Did, did they say anything like that? Did any words like that escape their lips while they were crucified there, hanging upon the cross? Well, no. It's quite doubtful that they had ever heard anyone express such confidence in the afterlife. Let's look back in Luke 23 and notice what is probably the seventh statement made by Jesus from the cross. And it is in Luke 23 and verse number 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into thy hands I commend or I commit my spirit. And having said thus, He gave up the ghost. King James language, He died. The immaterial aspects of Jesus departed from His material body. Now notice all those statements. Notice all those things that are said about Jesus. Was Pilate's wife correct 
in declaring Jesus to be a just man? Had there been an adequate amount of accurate, acceptable statements to conclude that Pilate's wife was indeed correct in her assessment of Jesus of Nazareth to be a just man? The answer to that is yes. She wasn't almost right about that. She was dead on the money that Jesus was a just man. But you know, despite all those statements, it didn't stop the wicked, did it? Despite all that evidence being piled up, it did not stop the wicked from carrying out their wickedness. So what? So what? In the third place, let's talk about the solution. What will be our response? evidence presented about Jesus. Well, is the solution cowardice? Be like Pilate? Cower down to the desires, the wants, the wishes of the multitude? Shall we be like Pilate and cower to the whims of the people? Shall we be afraid to reveal how we really feel about Jesus Christ? We need to consider very deeply the words of our Lord from Mark 8 and verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him also, and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. When he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You don't know what that means. If we're ashamed of Jesus here, he's going to be ashamed of us on the other side. There. When we need a friend, no matter what, we're all going to walk through the threshold of death by ourselves. We may be surrounded by people, but when we cross the threshold of death, you need a friend, and so do I. We want Jesus to have the angels there waiting on us. They escort us into paradise. But what's the catch, so to speak? What are the conditions? If we're cowards here, if we're ashamed of Him, in this adulterous and sinful generation, He's going to be ashamed of us there when we need a friend. When we really need someone to be there for us. is when we breathe our last breath. So is the solution cowardice? Well, we're going to have to say, no, that's, that's not the solution. Well, is the solution compromise? Shall we extend lip service to the Son of God, offering praise to His holy name while living in rebellion to His teaching? Is that what we do? We, we say what's right, but we show something different. You know, Jesus had something to say about that in Luke 6 and verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's a fair question, wouldn't you say? Is the solution compromised? Let's, let's say Lord, Lord, but then turn around and show something totally different. Why well, call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Well, the solution's not cowardice. The solution's not compromise. Well, what about conviction? We'll have conviction in our heart. Is, is conviction, is this the solution? Shall our hearts burn with conviction that Jesus is just, righteous, innocent, and holy while we sit idle in the pews week after week after week, after week. You know, Jesus had many people that believed on him. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men. More than the praise of God. Is that us? Is that us? We, we have conviction in Jesus, but we can't follow through on that conviction because what if everybody knows? What if everybody knows that I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength? I love my neighbor as myself. Jesus is a just man. He's more than a just man. He's the Savior of all. So the conviction is God is headed on the right path, but once our hearts are on fire, we need to act on that conviction because the solution is conversion. Here's the solution. 
It's time to act upon our conviction and change. At the end of what we know is the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord gave a marvelous illustration. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. You know, there's one verse really that allows us to see. Are we building upon a rock? Or are we building upon the sand? How do we feel about our Lord's words in Mark 16, 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. While we have no other inspired record of Pilate's wife and her behavior, her dream was right. She was right in her dream. What say ye about Jesus of Nazareth? Is he a just man or is he just a man? Listen. Is he a just man or is he just a man? Is he God in the flesh? Does Jesus possess the ability and the authority to cleanse all sinners from their personal transgressions? If we believe that, we need to act on it. Now is the time. How do we act upon our conviction? How do we change from a sinner to a saint? Hear the gospel. Acts 18. Believe the gospel. Acts 16.31. Repent of sin. Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. And be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. Every person that obey, obeys that pattern of doctrine from the heart, the Lord's blood will wash away the spiritual consequences of all that individual's past sins. And the Lord Himself will add that individual to the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ, the location of all the saved. Acts 2, 41. In Acts 2.47, we die with Christ, we're buried with Christ, we're raised up to walk in newness of life with Christ. It's time to behave as a Christian. That's what we do, but we don't. And even as God's children, as Christians, we sin, we miss the mark. What does God expect of us when we miss that mark and we stumble back into sin? It's Acts 8.22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray, God. Perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. Wherever you are, make it right here now. As together we stand, as together we sing the song.
If there are visitors or you're welcome, honored guests, there's no further announcements at this time. We'll be dismissed. <coughs> Let's all pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful and blessed for this opportunity we had on this Lord's Day to simply here for worship. And we do pray that everything that was said and done was in complete accordance with your will. We're thankful for our church family that's able to be with us, that have had health issues and, and again are able to physically be here today. We're thankful for all that are here and Continue to pray that that as this COVID virus is, is treated with vaccines and other means, medical means and measures, we just pray that our that our brothers and sisters will will continue to want to be here in person. And we are uplifted by those that are with us today. For those that are visiting with us, we're thankful for their presence as well and pray that they'll have an opportunity to worship with us soon. For our church family that's lost loved ones, we continue to pray for them. Most recently, and, and, and this week with Dixie Black, and, and for our brothers and sisters in Christ that have lost a, a faithful gospel preacher, Melvin Sapp, we are thankful for having known Melvin and the influence that he has had on your church and on many, dear Heavenly Father. And we continue to pray for the works of your church here in Lexington, that they'll always be fruitful, that you will receive the praise and glory and the honor. And we're thankful for the lesson that, that Brock brought to us this morning from your word, and help us to, to look at your word and examine our lives. And, and we just pray that others will see Christ through the lives that we live. And dear Heavenly Father, that we will be looked at as, as righteous and just. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we pray and give thanks for all things, most of all thankful for your Son, the sacrifice he made for our sins, and the willingness to die on the cross for our sins, yet he was sinless. We pray that as we leave this building this morning, that again, others will see Christ in the lives that we live, and that we will return at our next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat>